Welcome to Breaking Down Bits, a conversation about great comedy bits with the comedians who wrote and performed them. Hey, Drew Jordan, how are you? What's up? I'm good, man. How you been? How you been? I've been good. This is Brian Gendron, and this is Breaking Down Bits, episode seven. Yeah, I we're we're coming up on the the end of the first season. This is crazy how fast this has gone, but uh, I feel like we've come across so many great uh, nuggets of stand up and writing and performance wisdom in these last six episodes. It's been so fun. Absolutely. Uh, I can tell, say, I, for one, have learned a tremendous amount from the comics we've had. It's already shown improvement in my writing, and hopefully everybody who's been listening and joining in, this has been helpful for you as well. Yeah, I, you know, if, if I'm going back, trying to pick maybe some of, at this point, maybe some of my favorite um, things that have helped me, honestly, like, the Danny Palumbo episode probably put something in my head that's so obvious and so easy, but it's helped me out tremendously just working silence. Cause I think I really struggle with the performance side of stand up. Not that I'm an amazing writer, but my writing is a little ahead of my performance for sure. And so I struggle with the performance side of things. And I've got a chance to hit a few shows recently here and there and um, my pacing and just waiting and using that silence has just totally shifted um my performance and i've loved just keeping that in the back of my head it's been really helpful to me yeah absolutely your performance is terrible uh uh, no 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 no, man you're great i really do and this is only making you better uh and look so i i had more performance elements coming from a toastmasters public speaking background so i was able to kind of get by with shoddy writing And so things like talking to Andy Huggins and and talking to uh, Joel Byers and getting into Joel Byers Write 10 has been incredibly helpful for me to actually write, actually get down and write. And now I'm I'm growing those muscles and starting to do that. So, uh, Drew, I think we're both on to something here. And of course, uh, if you wanted to go back and listen to any of those episodes, the easiest way to get at it is to go to our website, BreakingDownBits.com. We're on Apple, Spotify, Google uh, YouTube to watch the video versions, which is gives you a little bit of extra because we do watch the performances as we evaluate them with our guests. So breaking out bits.com, go out and get it. Yeah. Drew, you ready to uh, bring in our guest? I am. I'm excited about this one. This is, uh, this is going to be a fun one, an amazing comic. Finally, you know, a little more female presence on breaking down bits. So it's been, it's been nice to, uh, to kind of mix it up a little bit. Um, so we're going to do a little intro and get to know Sarah Tolamash. Let's go ahead and get to know her. Sarah Tolamash is a stand-up comedian, writer, and podcast host. She's been featured on Comedy Central as well as NBC's Last Comic Standing, The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, and The Late Late Show with James Corden. She's also appeared on Comedy Central's Roast Battle and Gotham Comedy Live. Sarah is the co-host of the popular weekly podcast called Badge. And when she's not touring comedy clubs around the country, Sarah can be seen regularly at the Comedy Cellar and the New York Comedy Club in New York City. All right, Sarah. Hey. Hi, guys. How are you today? I'm good. This is probably the earliest I've done a podcast. We have we have you go. Well, you probably you've done AM ra- or uh, radio in the morning, right? For for shows and stuff. No, not really. So this uh, is like the earliest. Well, well, thanks for waking up with us yeah, today. I appreciate that. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, we are so excited to have you on. Of course, uh, you got your start in Houston, Texas, which is where Drew and I sit here today. So. Uh, there's a lot we can talk about there, but we're excited to, to break down some of your comedy today and pick your brain on writing and and, and get to know you a little more. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, we, we, one thing we like to do just right off the top is just to jump in and just start picking your brain. Like how, just super open, open-ended question, how does Sarah Tolomash uh, write comedy? Um, I wish I could say I'm one of those comics that like dedicates – a few hours every day and just barfs out drafts onto my book, but I don't, I 
do feel like I obsess over stuff enough. So uh, every moment of the day, I'm constantly thinking of what could be funny. And so I just tweet throughout the day and then, or jot down an idea in either it's a tweet or I'll make it into a video. And then I'll take the tweet and if it feels like it does well, then um, I'll do it on stage. And even if the tweet doesn't do well and I still think it's really like a funny idea, I'll, I'll do it on stage. And then from there I go, then I start... Once I'm doing it on stage, then I'd start adding on to it as I perform it each time. So we hear that. Yeah, Sarah, we hear that quite a bit that people use Twitter as this tool to get thoughts and ideas out there. And it can be used in a few ways, right? You can almost copyright it that way or trademark it. So that way you, I got to it first. Look, check the date. Uh, but you said that you, you test the success of the jokes through that medium. How do you, what, what is your gauge? Is it just uh, interaction with the, with the tweet? How do you know if it's successful or not based on the feedback? I think with interaction, back in the day, it used to be when you could tweet and then it would directly link up to your Facebook. And then I would get just tons of comments under those uh, ones that I felt like were doing well or people like, I don't know, were open to. But then that stopped. But then like you can gauge through interaction on Twitter or just like faves and retweets. But I've had jokes that didn't really do well on Twitter. And I was like, I still like it. And I did it on stage and it worked out fine. So, I Are mean, you you, it's not necessarily like a gauge to know if it works out that way. One thing we always have conversations about is like, people who are paper and pad writers and people who are digital. Do you do anything on paper and ink? Are you, are you writing in a notebook or are you all digital? I mean, I will. And I, I will do it just so I can feel like I'm doing something. But like, <laughs> honestly, I don't think I've ever written a bit where I was like, that was great. Like it, <laughs> I prefer when my bits come organically rather than, forcing them because I don't know. I just think it's funnier that way. If it's from conversation or hanging out rather than I find that sometimes trying to, I've tried to do stuff that I've written. And when I do it on stage, I find it quite sterile and it misses like the fun that I, I had when I originally thought of it. That, that makes a lot of sense after hearing your comedy, because I think your your jokes are incredibly relatable. Like it's all stuff that we've thought, talked about with our friends, experienced like every single bit seems to be like something that I have a personal slight connection to. And it's it's great at keeping I was engaged on every bit because I'm like, oh yeah, I've talked about that with my friends or that's a that's something that I've experienced personally and that's that's excellent. Maybe that's because of the way you write. Yeah, I guess so. It's just funny. Like, you know, it's weird. I, I did America's Got Talent in the beginning of the pandemic, like right at the beginning. And Simon Cowell was like, I don't understand any of these. <laughs> 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 and I realized later it's because he's, he's ridiculously rich. wealthy <laughs> and also grew in. He was born into wealth and that he's never experienced any of these like sad moments in life <laughs> where the other three panelists all started from like, you know, uh, you know, from maybe lower middle class or like, you know, st had some struggle, but it wasn't like they went to private school and then immediately after that had success in the like music recording world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my whole life is just terribly sad. So your comedy is <laughs> nailing me on all cylinders. <laughs> Most people's I, all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the struggle, I think. And also, I just feel like I have, I've always probably come from the mindset that I find life very difficult. <laughs> Yeah. Are we doing counseling right now? Or are we having a pot? I don't know what's happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, even the most mundane stuff that would seem so simple, I'm like, why is this a struggle? And I do find it funny that like these little things in life I find to be like huge obstacles. And I think that's where I like writing. Yeah, it's great. 
There's a, we had a Rick Roberts on not too long ago and he talked about bringing risk into your bits that really helps draw people in. And, and, uh, and he seems like you do the same with, with obstacles. Everybody faces challenges and there's, that's where the, the jokes are. That's where the, the funny can come from. Uh, oh yeah. I, I wanted to, to veer off script a little drew with Sarah. And, and again, cause we have that connection and we're in Houston, Texas. We're in a, uh, a, a huge Metro market, but a smaller, let's say comedy market as, especially as it compares to New York and LA. And Sarah, you of course moved to New York. I think you told me in 2008. Mm -hmm. So a, a lot of comics are, are just, they're, they're always like, I'm going to move next year or I'm going to move after this. And it just feels, I'm always just like, go, just do, why wouldn't you go? Um, so do you have any thoughts about, about when is the right time? Well, I personally think for myself, I went too late, but I think once you have like a decent tight seven, you should probably go. I just feel like, wow. At least in New York, you can bomb in obscurity for a long time. Like industry is not coming out to a lot of those shows. So you can kind of you can almost start in New York. I don't think it's that ideal because it's so rough. It's expensive. And then, it's, you know, but you do get way more stage time. But I, I don't think it's good to get to to be like very complacent in your scene. And I think you don't. I think the longer you stay where you're comfortable, the harder it is going to be for you to go to a bigger pond because it is such a wake up call. Like no one gives a shit about your credits out here. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's really wise. I mean, complacency is going to be the biggest thing that's going to be working against you. And then what do you, you, you maybe you meet a girl and, and then you, you get married and have kids and then it's over. You missed your shot. Right. So tight seven. I, that's, that's great. I mean, that's yeah. so but many I comics say, are ready. I mean, you can do, I don't know, just because of pandemic, I think you can actually, if you go up on stage in your town or whatever and create, like, go up quite a bit there, but then, like, work online stuff, I think you can get yourself your own following now. I'm just thinking that with now, with pandemic, because I focused a lot more on online content since we ran out of stage time and I feel like that's just as beneficial too. What was, what was your first year? Like when you made the jump to a major market, like what was your experience right out of the gate when you, were you nervous to like, to the step into this new world? Yeah. Well, first of all, I don't, I have like, um, I guess like performance anxiety and I still get it. Um, and I got comfortable in Houston cause I don't really care too much about the audience but i like i care about what other comics think in that scene and so i got comfortable with houston comics and so once that happened like i felt very comfortable a lot more comfortable on stage and then when i moved to new york i didn't know anybody so in a weird way i felt like i was starting all over again yeah that's gotta be it I, that just thinking that kind of terrifies me just a little bit just to go into a whole scene of people where you just don't like it's there's something about knowing your scene and you're walking into the cheers bar where you're like hey hey buddy hey buddy everybody knows who you are like it's just so comfortable you get so comfortable in your own scene oh yeah i mean i that's why i think it's always good like if you're in your own scene to like try to do gigs outside of that town by yourself like so you can kind of get used to being like a you feel like a lone wolf sometimes, I think. Yeah. I think Drew and I both have those opportunities. So we get a, a little bit more of a unique perspective than some folks that just stay locally or, or travel within a certain radius of, of, of Houston or whatever market you're in. Uh, but, but yeah, I think uh, complacency is, is big. Uh, but uh, also you mentioned that you're uh, you get comfortable with the comics and the scene. I think when you get out of that and you go to something as scary as New York, I think that's where you really learn the most about yourself. You learn the most about your comedy and there's a lot of comedy in that. Um, but you hit on the big thing, which is it's expensive, right? That's going to be everybody's one, one of the main things that hold them back. You got to get, I guess you got to work at a coffee shop or whatever, you get a day job, right? And you're going to have to grind yeah. it out. And people it's just, brutal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. You're doing, you're doing a full-time job during the day. If you can find one of those jobs that pays well, that's part-time, then that's great. But I, I didn't really have that experience. So you're working 40 hour work weeks and then you're going out every, 
every night. Like it's just, you're getting home at one, you have to wake up at seven, seven thirty to get back to work. It's just like, it's brutal. If you had to do it all over again, I, obviously you're, you're a wonderful stand up, and that is uh, you, you have that skill, but nowadays, you know, like you mentioned, there's more options. There's YouTube, there's, there's these other platforms that you can do comedy on and, and be kind of successful would would you have leaned into those other areas or was stand up particularly like your love? Um, well, when I first started, those things weren't offered to us. It was only until maybe when I moved to New York. And then only I think in the last five or four years has it been that people have actually really started taking advantage of it. I think at first we were kind of like, what is this and how can it be used for a benefit? And there you know, there's a lot of apps that went down. Um, I think p having like Twitter and all that and YouTube, because I know a lot of comics now are starting to really work on building their YouTube channel because we're seeing it as like, you know, most of the time the industry won't give you a special and we'll see, we, we're seeing some of the bigger guys that don't get specials put their own content to their YouTube channel, their own specials. And if you yeah. can get thousands of subscribers if not like you know like in the few hundred thousand you have your own network yeah you can generate ad sales you become your own business and you don't have to answer to anybody i think that's a pretty cool yeah we've seen a couple of comics here in houston have some some pretty big success with that uh, you know roxy hayes is on the upswing yeah. and uh uh doesn't uh, uh gosh blanking on another uh, yeah, but I can't pronounce his name, but he's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's that's very good advice. I mean, you're right. You don't have to go to those markets. But of course, you know, the, what you're limiting is the ability to rub elbows or, or bump into somebody or have somebody happen to upon a set that's an industry. We don't get as much of that uh, is oh, certainly the case. It's right? huge. That's why you want to move. I think sometimes to New York or L.A. People are just naturally lazy, like in the industry, and they'd rather just dip into the backyard because they know that it feels like the best of the best have moved to New York. Yeah. Lazy executives. Uh, well, <laughs> you're right. I mean, you're right though. You'll be surprised. It's like even the top people at Comedy Central still fuck up all the time with like bookings. Like they accidentally booked the wrong person and they didn't know that until they came to the gig. So you just realize <laughs> nobody's doing their job. <laughs> just be available. Just be in the, yeah. right, in the yeah. right city. <laughs> and right. most of your work comes from other comics. Yeah. That's like the end of crashing when he has to open for John Mulaney and they booked <laughs> the wrong, the wrong guy. Um, but no, I was thinking of Chingo Bling, Bling is the. Oh yeah, he's thinking. great. Yeah. Yeah. Big, big YouTube following first. Uh, okay. Let's go back to script. That was a lot of fun. And I think it's going to be really meaningful for a lot of comics that are in that, that space, right? They're, they know they're talented, but they're, they're just on the fence. Do I, yeah. do I go? Do I not? Or do I even need to go to your point? So yeah. Yeah. seven minutes is seven minutes is something a lot of people have. They have it. There's a, yeah. there's, that's a pretty big window. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's get, let's zoom back in um, to how do you prepare for a set? Um, I don't know. I like generally writing out my set list. I, even though sometimes I'm like, I don't really need to do this, but I like it because it makes me feel like I'm taking a, an active moment to look over instead of just kind of like, Oh, I got this. And then sometimes you go on stage and you're like, I don't really have it. I, you know, <laughs> I put, cause it puts you in the zone, I think. So I like doing that. Um, I usually stick to the same opener generally for a while. Um, but if I'm feeling it or like, I feel like if it's a show that I don't feel like, uh, kind of like a bar show, then I'll work on a new, a new opener. And then from there I'll sprinkle in tried and true, but then I'm generally trying to fit in a few new bits. Cause I, I generally feel like you should be trying to add one new thing every time you go on stage. Yeah. Do you have a flow? If, a flow? Do you have like a like, flow to your set? Like there's an order to it or is it, is it just rearranged every time? Um, well, I think generally, I think, for your first stuff beginning should be something that's like about you something 
that people will warm up to. I think I've like almost like I get to know you, but totally. without being so on the nose, like a little bit about me. Like I can't <laughs> stand it when comics start their set that way. I'm like, duh. <laughs> <laughs> this is all about you. This is, yeah. <laughs> you're a narcissist. That's why and... we're here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And you don't even have to be like, so I'm from here and I'm from here. Like, I I just feel like something that what you're thinking about, um, an incident that will really prove who you are as a person. And then um, generally, I think you should start maybe clean or not too abrasive. I think you want the crowd, especially if they don't know who you are, you want them on your side a little bit. And then if you're feeling it, you can take them to weirder places but i i say that and there's no hard rules like there's tons of people that start off dirty and there's nothing wrong with that it's just what you're i think what you're comfortable with and how you feel like what you can get away with yeah our our first guest is andy huggins who i'm sure you know being from houston and uh one I love of the andy. Things, he's great right but one of the things that i i always appreciate is the longer he can go through a set without dropping an f-bomb it's like a spring like it's <laughs> it's so good because they don't expect it right um oh so I, yeah so i like the idea of, of starting clean and kind of ramping up to kind of maybe seeing what you can get away with testing the crowd uh because you never know you know maybe there's a concentration of of people from Drew's hometown that are that are over overtly Christian. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if my parents are in the audience, you're not going to win any awards for dropping an F-bomb, I'll tell you that. Oh, yeah. Well, I I mean, I don't have anything wrong against cussing, but I think after, I've listened to myself cuss, and it's like makes me cringe. I mean, it's not like I'm not dirty, but I don't try to put in like fucking shit everywhere. I just think it sounds stupid, and you can use better words. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, the Scott Dickers, who is our, who is the, uh, the founding editor of The Onion, who's our third guest, I think, talked about shock. You know, use it sparingly is, is the right way to, to use it in your sets or in your comedy. Uh, OK, so let's let's zoom in even further. Sarah, what are you doing right before you get on stage? The moments before. Um. I'm probably just going over my set list, making sure I want to remember to do that one bit that I've maybe forgot at the other show that I it's newish. Uh, or I don't know, I'm goofing off with other comics. Sometimes it makes me feel fun and light. And mm. I, I, you know, I used to be like more like rock in a fetal position before I got on stage. <laughs> but, you know, the more you do it, the more comfortable you get and realize that even if you forget something, it's fine and it's all for fun and it doesn't need to be perfect. And so I think sometimes like just hanging out and having a laugh with other people makes me feel it takes me out of my head more, which I like. Yeah, we heard that from Danny Palumba. That was a he has a similar vibe too. He's like, I I'm at my best when I'm when I walk on stage right after kind of just riffing and being comfortable and conversational with people backstage, it helps them be more, I think, conversational on stage. Um, oh yeah. Well, right I think it. sometimes like I've had this bad habit, especially in clubs that don't have a green room and you have to hang out in the back of the showroom. I mean, you start watching that audience and you get so judgmental and it really can get in your head and you're like, they could be the most pleasant people, but because you see some guy that like reminds you of some douchebag that you dealt with, you automatically <laughs> assume they're an asshole. And then you're like, look at that. That guy's going to be a problem. <laughs> and so I prefer not to walk into that or have like a prejudgment of the audience and then just go in and then, you know, figure it out. But you, I, sometimes I do want to know who's the who's chatty before a show or like if I've noticed every single comic has laid into one person and I realize it doesn't seem to be working, then I know from myself that I'm going to not engage with that person because it seems to be derailing the show. Perfect. That's really smart. Yeah. And, and I, you know, you talk mentioned off the top performance anxiety. I, I got it pretty heavy. I think we all do. Right. And and so your way of dealing with that is to just goof around in the green room and, and just be able to, to keep things light. Uh, that's really smart. Uh, and something that helps. Sometimes you forget. And sometimes, like you said, you, you get into the audience and you, you're 
you're, you're maybe getting looking a little too deeply into the audience. <laughs> yeah. So get a, get a few things to look for, but don't don't f- yeah find that ex boyfriend or what you know whatever. It's, that, that, oh that yeah, bothered. that's gonna throw you off. Uh-huh. Very good. Um, so we're, now we're gonna zoom into the actual performance that we're gonna watch. Uh, before I do that though, most of the jokes are on. <laughs> you're like, I don't want to see myself. <laughs> uh, most of the jokes that you tell, if not all of them, I know at least two out of three, maybe all three are on your your new comedy album that came out this year. I'm gonna go ahead and show a picture of it. Uh, Voluptuous Boy. Uh, I listened to it on iTunes, which uh, I believe they probably give you a penny or two for, for me doing that. Um, is Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> uh, is, so they can get it on. Is it where else can they can they get access to the album? I think it's on everything that you can stream. So like Pandora and Spotify. Um, and if you have like an iTunes subscription, you can stream it on on iTunes. Perfect. Well, I, I listened to it uh, a couple weeks ago. I listened to it again yesterday. Uh, very very funny, uh, and a lot we can talk mm-hmm. about uh, through these few clips. So I'm going to go ahead and and get this clip queued up. As I do this, uh, do you remember which clip we're doing? Uh, I think it's a Adam Devine's. I believe it's. Oh uh, yeah. Is it in Hawaii? Is it? Yeah, it's in Hawaii. That was my first like big TV. That was my break. A big break. Oh, perfect. Yeah. yeah. If, you can, if you can, would you like? Can you talk us through the setup of what? that performance specifically was like what what happened before how how'd you get that that opportunity yeah sure um so they that's why this is why it's really good to live in new york because they don't really do this or in la like because they don't really do this other places they maybe sometimes do it in austin but most of the time they choose everybody from new york or la um i did a showcase you do tons of showcase shows for like tv show or networks and they were doing a a showcase. I did it. That showcase was like six or eight months before I got the call. So I kind of forgot about it. I thought that things had moved on and it's just like life went on. And then I got a phone call um, from my manager being like, Oh, you got it. And I was so surprised because I'd been going out for showcases for years. And I kind of given up on the fact of like, maybe I wasn't going to get to do TV. And so they gave me my first break. And then when I, and it happened to be in Hawaii and you got to do a little bit of light acting and they were so nice. The guys of at like Adam Dine and his writing partner, um, Scott, I forgot his Scott. I think it's Scott, Pe- not Scott Peterson. I'll know it. He goes by mud flap on Twitter. Um, <laughs> it's called mud flap. Okay. Yeah. And they were so nice. They call you beforehand uh, and talk to you about like the experience or like what to expect. Then you get there and then also very gracious. And then the show, the way they set it up, it's like, it's in it. Like they created what looks like a comedy club. So you got to have that intimate feeling that you're at a comedy club. And then, um, they were really, yeah, really nice. And I got, I just kept to the same set that I showcased with other, they were very loose. You didn't have to like transcript your acts, which you have to do a lot of the times for TV. Um, you, it was very loose. So if you, you could do a whole different set than what you had done for them and it wouldn't have mattered. Oh, wow. That, that's, that's the difference between comics running it and, you know, TV network running it. Right. So yeah. Well, like if you do a late night, you there's you can't go off script. Like they're like, this is what you're doing, what you showcase, what we the set that we have approved, and that's that's what you have to stick to. And they literally transcribe it, don't they? Yeah, I, you have to write it out. I kind of don't understand why, but <laughs> you do it. I don't question anything. That's right. Well, let's go ahead and show the first clip. I've broken it up into three different jokes. Y'all, y'all ready? Yeah. Do it. Let's do it. I was talking to my friend from back home and she was telling me this story about like how every time she goes to the zoo, she goes to the baboon exhibit. There's always one baboon that is constantly masturbating. (laughs) And when she told me this, I was like, ugh, I get it. You're good looking. (laughs) You don't have to waste my time with the masturbating baboon story to let me know how hot you are. I never get a masturbating baboon when I go to that zoo. I even put on my sexiest dress. I'm like, Mr. Monkey, come on, masturbate. 
He just signs back, I have a headache. <laughs> I was like, how'd you learn that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Is, is that Houston Zoo? Uh, yeah, it's my friend from Houston. Uh, yes. <laughs> but I, I think knew it. all... All baboons masturbate in every zoo that you go to. <laughs> I, I know fact. that. I know that monkey. I know that monkey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's so good. It's so relatable. And I think one thing, I think the th one thread that I see through um, a lot of your comedy is once again, that relatability who hasn't been to the zoo and seen the monkey doing something awkward. We all have that experience built into our brains. So there is, and it sets you up for amazing misdirect because we all think we know where you're going. And so like when you start the monkey bit, of course, we're like, okay, this is going to be a poop joke. And then, it, okay, it's not a poop joke. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then like you just turn the corner and, and just like really take it somewhere where I didn't think it was going. And it's just beautiful the way that you to keep, you, tw you find a way to twist it so well. Oh, well, thanks. That was an actual scenario. Have, do you ever like hang out with, <laughs> you have that friend, I don't know if guys have this, but girls have this one friend that a lot of times it's especially from their extremely attractive friend and they tell you a story and then you're like, is this story just to let us know that somebody <laughs> was like telling you how hot you are? <laughs> yeah. Like there's no plot point or character development in this. Did you're just like, <laughs> what? That had nothing to do with anything. So I have a friend like that and she, but she did tell this story and I was like, oh my God, Samantha. <laughs> of course she's a Samantha. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, that, you're right. That's a very relatable. So Drew's right. You have a relatable scenario or you could be like, yeah, of course that would happen at a zoo. If, even if you hadn't been in that exact situation and then you've made it personal and very personal. And then it's also relatable personal because you're like, everybody's got that, like the best looking friend of them that just want to get it out there that, that they thought I was good looking. And then you do something that you do with all with your one of the things that I think you do really well in that just across the entire album. So even in a longer set, you've got great beats like you're it's uh, you, you're you set up and you kind of go from this place of high to low and it's in a rhythm and it's almost like always the same amount of time. And so you cue up the audience when to laugh and, and it's well written. So they laugh and it, it's just it's incredible to watch you just do that over and over and over again and do it really well. Uh, how did you develop? Did you always have that rhythm or is this something that you, you kind of had to develop and learn over time or something you don't even think about? It's Well, I guess you don't really think about it, but I think it ends up happening naturally when you start running like three sets a night, you, <laughs> you establish your, your rhythm and all it's almost weird. And I think a lot of comics talk about this. Sometimes it's not even the words that are coming out of your mouth. It's, the rhythm that you have set up that it's almost like a Pavlov training. It feels like cheating that you get the audience to laugh. I mean, there are times when I forgot in a set sentence in a joke and I was like, you know, this joke didn't make any sense. And then you guys <laughs> still laughed at it. And it's because I've, I know how to s hit the rhythm of it. Also, I love the little punch ins. It felt like in, when I was listening, maybe that Mr. Monkey, that Mr. Monkey part was a nice little punch. <laughs> Do you, oh, thanks. <laughs> do you, when, when, once you write the joke, I mean, I'm sure you're just constantly workshopping, looking for those little moments to, to punch up the story here and there uh, just to make sure the laughs keep coming. Oh, all the time. And I think I've heard this before with Jake Johansson. He's like, uh, who's one of my favorite comics. He said, if you want a comic to do more, it you have to laugh. And it really does feel like, I end up writing more when I feel like the audience is really on my side that even to this day, even on old jokes, I'm, I'll do, I'm like, I just added more tags to something just to freshen it up. And I went in a direction that I wouldn't have gone into, but only because the audience was like really on board with it. Yeah. That's gotta be a thing as you get, as you do, you know, obviously, uh, as a professional comic and doing it so much, how, how do you stay fresh with those jokes? How do you keep those? How do you stay in the moment with these jokes that you've been maybe telling for a while that are your, your killer jokes? You got to get tired of them at some point and you, you can't yeah. bring the same energy to those jokes or, or you have to try. I don't know, but you can add, sometimes you can add tags. I always joke. My writing process is 
write a joke, tag it three years later. Because <laughs> <laughs> it just it just happens. Like you know, sometimes you do a joke and you've been doing it for a while. You put it on the back burner and then you 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 bring it out again for some reason and then you ended up tagging it differently this time. And then you're like, well, that worked out better than how I was doing it before. And then you're like, well, it's kind of a new joke now. And then you bring it back. Yeah, that's a cool thing. Re retouch a tag on the end of something familiar. Yeah, or I sometimes think switching your order of things can kind of freshen things up a little bit if you're kind of tired of doing the same set over and over again or the jokes. I, I mean, I think that's sometimes how you... Have you ever had a joke that's like, it works and then after a few months it stops working? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's because you're not having fun with it anymore. Totally. Yeah, you don't, you're not bringing the same energy. You're not selling it the way you used to because yeah, it's not special to you anymore and you're, you're on no. to bigger and better things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to set up the next, next joke. Y'all ready? Let's yeah. go. I thought my sister's email was hacked recently. turns out she actually is concerned about my belly fat. <laughs> I was like, Oh, thanks for the link to these pills. So now I'm concerned about my belly fat. So I got one of those bathing suits that girls get to hide their midsection. It's called a tankini. <laughs> Ladies, have you ever worn one of these? It's, yeah, it's supposed to hide your fat roll, but it's just like a one piece bathing suit. And then they just cut out this part right here where your fat roll is, where you're like, that's the most important part on the bathing suit. I need that. <laughs> So when you sit down, it slowly seeps out and you just look like a busted can of biscuits sitting on the beach. Really, that's not hiding it. It like looks like a mammogram down there. You guys are nice. Uh, I did a show a few weeks ago and this guy came up to me afterwards and he was like, can I be brutally honest with you? And I was like, no, thank you. <laughs> That was close. <laughs> I almost got my feelings hurt. I hate brutally honest people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so if I love that, I'm a, I'm a sucker for alliteration. So I loved slowly seeps out and busted biscuits and all, all that kind of stuff. Just, I don't know. It just, I, I'm a fan of that. It just clicks. It seems to like it has something to it that just catches people's attention. Oh, thank that one. Je my husband was there for that taping and we talk about it to this day. I said busted wrong. It sounded, it says boosted. <laughs> <laughs> boosted. So every time I hear it, I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> cringe, but it's not enough to like, I, I didn't don't know, know. The, yeah. focus on it too much, but yeah. <laughs> did you go with, so you were in Hawaii. Uh, did you play that because, because bathing suits in Hawaii because of the situation or were you just planning on doing that? Mm. Um, That was in the set that I, showcase for but yeah i did it there sometimes i'm like when i was doing that joke i was i felt weird doing it in the winter time like we we're like how do i get to bathing suit when it's <laughs> holiday like christmas season right now i have a that's like a big thing most of the time most people don't care you can just talk about whatever at any time of the year but i do and so it makes it weird and i don't like doing it on stage so if i don't like doing it when it feels like a weird time of the year to do it it's actually, it. <laughs> there must be a voluptuous, voluptuous boy. There was one point where you're like, I was, it's football season. You're like, wait, no, there's no football right now. There's no, just imagine it's football season. I don't feel like changing it. <laughs> so you, yeah. can fun, you can have fun with the, with the absurdity of, of it being in, a, in bathing suits in winter too. Keeps it fresh for you. Yeah. Well, it's just kind of like, I mean, how many times can we say recently in our set? It just is so <laughs> annoying to hear that. You're like, you don't have to say that, but we do it anyway because it feels like people need to hear it, but you don't. That's right. Yeah. How do you feel about transitions? Like when you, when you're getting in and out of this material, do you feel like you, there's, it's a necessary transition or are you just like take a breath and hit the next thing and not, don't worry about it? I think you can take a break and like hit, go on to the next thing. I mean, just think about how conversation flows anyway. You can talk and then you bounce from the next subject pretty easily. That's maybe like a one, 180. Um, I do try to tie things together that have um, are in the similar area, like say like money problems or appearance or like, uh, you know, I don't know, struggling stuff that 
I usually put those in the same in the same block so I can memorize it easier. Sure. Yeah. I, oh God, I struggle so much with memory it, I, and that's, that's my anxious part. Like I, before I, I'm, <laughs> I'm like, I did a set uh, last night and I literally brought my he- ear earbuds or whatever those things are called. I had one in before the show and I was walking around re-listening to my last set just so I could kind of like, ah, I need, I need something to hold on to in my brain because I'm, I'm terrified of, you know, as I'm getting it asked to do longer and longer sets, um, yeah, it's messing with my confidence because I get on stage and I feel like I got to have my phone back there to double check and I hate it so much. Oh, it's awful. But you know what? I think it's fine. It's life. It's like hard to be perfect all the time. And if that's your thing that's in your head, like, and I work on this too. I'll like, I, now I have a whole bunch of pizza jokes because of quarantine (laughs) (laughs) that i did them the other day and i was like oh man i go guys i have one more pizza moment i forgot to talk about that i'd really like to talk to you guys so i'm just gonna do that so i don't even care anymore i just feel like and they're on board and you're trying to explain your thought process and i think they appreciate that i mean some people might disagree but i mean I think having perfection is such a huge roadblock in ourself and to do be funny. And I think it's fine to like be open about what you're thinking. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's that's great. That's like a release valve, you know, for the perfectionist in me for sure to go like, look, Drew, remember, it's about having fun. It's not about nailing your set list exactly the way that you thought you might do it. Right. Yeah, because no one's like, wow, that was he perfectly memorized all the stuff that they have no idea. And then you didn't get one laugh. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's not like a spelling bee. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know. I, I think there's these old rules that people have to live by. And then after a while, I'm like, why are we living by these? It's never set in stone. You can do whatever you want to do on stage. Yeah, Drew, you, uh, to Sarah's point, you almost, and I do the same thing too sometimes, but you almost assume that they know what you're supposed to memorize. They, yeah. they, have, no, they have no fucking clue. You can go up there and do do whatever you want. You know? I think they have my notes in front of them and they're like, <laughs> yeah. mm, no, it's not late. Yeah. It's not, it's not late night television where you had to, you know, script it all out. Right. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I wanted to call out, and this is a good time, the, the very back the last part of that can i be brutally honest with you you so one of the things that you do really well i already mentioned was you you kind of lead into your setups and then your punches uh you have this character and sometimes you introduce other characters and it and it's usually you and it's, sometimes it's in your own head or sometimes it's dialogue and you have a voice for it uh the three things that i think you just do brilliantly over and over and over again is the setup and then you cut you introduce that character and, and what you're thinking or what you said uh, and then the writing is is really quality, and so th- that that equation is is really working for you, and, and something that that I aspire to do. So, uh, re- well done with that. And was Thank that you. Some, was that <laughs> is that in and out of sort of the narr- let's call it narrator to to Sarah's inner monologue? Is that something you've always done on stage? Is that something you kind of learned over time? Yeah, I actually think there are sometimes with like a set or like a bit, you're. A, you're like, I really wasn't expecting it to really play out this way, but it's just kind of like, it is a weird thing where like, I don't know why these are the words that I chose, but I like them and they work. And I got a reward system when I did it on stage and it, it, but then you're like, it's, 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 I wouldn't have put it together like that, but you just build it that way naturally. And I, that's, I kind of like it that way. So it lot, feels natural to me. That's so why. a lot of those. So that, let me, then it sounds like a lot of that comes from on stage work, right? Yes. So you, you throw a, okay, perfect. So you throw a premise out there and then you develop those, those punches and tags on, while you're on stage. Yeah. Well, you work on the, the, yeah, I guess you call them the beats or whatever. Uh, there is like, I don't know, as you were talking about like playing with silences and stuff like that, that's really beneficial. I think and part of keeping your timing and everything like yeah, doing a breath. If you take a breath between your next sentence, I think that helps out a whole bunch. Yeah, for sure. I think <clears throat> you mentioned your writing style is, is less pen to paper and more maybe out loud in your head thinking. And I think that's just a, there's things that I will, if I'm just like talking, talking out a bit, 
there's things I'll say that I would never write down. No. I, totally opposite brain parts. Well, that's like, it's like talking it out in a way. Like, that's why I have a hard time writing pen to paper for bits because I think you're, you're thinking in a way that it seems so straightforward and probably not as creative. And I feel like when you're either talking to other people or talking it out on stage with an interaction, I think you go down roads that you probably normally wouldn't have thought of going down. And I think that ends up lending itself to like having something that stands out a little bit more, I think. Yeah, no, it takes you a different place. Totally. I think. Yeah. I'm going to queue up the the third joke. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> I'm kind of poor. Like I live in a horrible apartment and uh, I feel like the only, like I live in New York and so it's really expensive there. And I feel like the only way to be happy there is just if you just make your taste match your budget. Do you guys ever do that? Where you're like, oh my God, I love business carpet in my apartment. I love watching movies on YouTube. <laughs> it's my favorite. <laughs> But I want to move out of my apartment right now because I have a broken window and I email my landlord to come fix it. And then he was like, I'll be on that ASAP. And it's been over two months now and he still hasn't fixed it. So I think he thinks ASAP means actually, sorry. Uh, <laughs> All right, guys, you've been real great. I'm Sarah Tomlach. Thank you so much. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, uh, such a great, <laughs> such a great punch at the end there. Just that unexpected misdirect, and once again for me, and maybe this is just my perspective, but I love when you you set up like we think you're gonna come up with some little witty uh, acronym to go along with ASAP, and then you just took this fun left turn of just like, uh, <laughs> it's yeah. Per perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, uh, my, my brain always wants to go for whatever reason to acronyms and trying to be clever with acronyms. Cause it, it's a form of wordplay and wordplay is fun. You made wordplay even more fun. Cause then you turned it into sound play as, as you went through it. And it's almost like we're with you writing the joke, just like, okay, I got the A and the S and then I'm the <laughs> like you yourself were, do <laughs> we're doing that. But I love yeah, that. Yeah. Honestly, lot. that was a, t well, it, it started off with frustration with the landlord and then it went into a tweet and then it was just like, I was like, this shit is so stupid, but it did so well on Twitter. And then when I did it on stage, I'm like, okay, if you guys are into it, because yeah. <laughs> like, it, it, it is so dumb and silly and kind of basic in a weird way. <laughs> was, was that the first idea or did you really try to write something clever and then, and then kind of decide to do something different later? No, that was the first idea. Well, first I was trying to, I actually was like thinking of uh, like what the P could be, yeah. I guess. But then it was like, he just fizzled out and I never heard back from him. So I was like, that's exactly what he did to me was like, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not coming to fix it. <laughs> I think uh, you've you you hit on the the F word, which is frustration. Uh, so many good bits can come out of frustration. And 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 early, very in the beginning, you talked about obsession. And I've been obsessed. And I even asked Drew. I'm like Drew, like with quarantine and and all this mask stuff. There's these new rules, and I'm just I'm I find myself frustrated for people not following the rules that we just learned about, and I get mad at them. And I'm like, I don't want to have this feeling. I don't know where the joke is yet, Sarah, but it comes from a place of frustration. Do you find yourself writing a lot in that that space? Yeah, I'm a lot. Like in this I've had a lot of jokes come to me while um, doing the dishes, like a mindless activity, <laughs> because you are actually thinking of the stuff that's been bothering you lately when you're like that. And I doing like a mindless activity, like driving. I think I write a lot of stuff like that or walking around. But I remember being like I had to go to the hospital because I got I I'd like to say they called it colitis, but that was just a general term. I actually ate, was eating like so much bags of lettuce because it was cheap back then. And I think, I actually think I got E. coli poisoning and it cost me $20,000. And I was like, I was like, that is so crazy to go. I had to go to the hospital for something like that. That is beyond my control. It wasn't like I had underlying conditions. Like I've never had stomach issues like that before. 
And I was so annoyed by it. And then I was like, that was really expensive diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's the name of your what next special. The next special is expensive diarrhea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I wrote that. I wrote a, a joke about, um, yeah, colitis in that way. Wow. Yeah, that, that's, that's fun. And that is on voluptuous boy. I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and put that up one more time. And, and then Sarah, we're going to land this plane. Drew, do you want to, uh, Ask her our last question while I get this up. Yeah, so Brian Brian has this thing he loves. <laughs> oh, it's my thing. It's, this is Brian's thing. <laughs> if you don't like it, it's Brian's thing. Um, <laughs> let's say it's a little morbid, but it's your tombstone. You've passed away. Uh, as a comedian, We we, what would you like to see written on your tombstone as your, maybe your final joke as your last laugh? Um... I don't know. This was, I had this thought and it's a joke that I did, but I didn't do it on my album that I might do it on the next one. But, uh, you know how, like it says that we're born in this world alone and then we die alone. And I'm like, well, I've also been doing a lot of alone in the middle. So I'd probably <laughs> have Sarah Talamash a lot of alone in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> like that, that big analogy, like the dash. That's the, yeah. <laughs> that's the alone in the middle. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's very smart. We're writing joke. We're writing jokes on the show. I love it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. I like that a lot. That's really good. And I, I relate again, because my life is just sad. And apparently your, <laughs> your jokes really connect with sad people. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like, I am a generally happy person, but it is really weird. Be, like I'm married, but I'm like, most of my life feels like I'm just doing things on my own. Yeah. Like yeah, well, eating by myself at Chipotle is like a huge <laughs> chunk or, or killing so much time in Starbucks. Like that is most of my life. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think it's so, it, you are so relatable. You're able to find those things that we all connect deeply with or have experience with. And I, I love that about your comedy. It's just, it's very real. And uh, it's, it's just like the dream of connectivity that I think we all mm, would like to create you. jokes that connect and you, you do that so well. It's fun. Well, Sarah, you've been such a delight and, and we really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, before we before we close out, do you want to share where people can find you and, and, and follow you? Yeah, follow me on Instagram at Stalamash, which is on the by my name um, or on Twitter. But I'm trying to build up my Instagram nice. or go to my YouTube channel, which is you just type in Sarah Talamash and you can find it. Yeah, sir. I know you've been doing quite a bit of sketch uh, in during quarantine, which is which is your call out and recommendation to comics. You know, why build up those followings? No matter no matter where you are, New York, L.A., Bangladesh, like you can build up your following, which is something that didn't exist ten years ago. Oh yeah, and it's fun. If you like it, do it. If you don't, don't stress out about it. That's right. Well, Sarah, thank you for coming. Thank you everybody for listening. Thank you, Drew Jordan, and uh, and go out and. Grab any of our other episodes. This is meant to be evergreen content. We will catch you on the next episode with Nori Davis. Yeah. Thanks so much, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to Breaking Down Bits. You can keep in touch or get more when you follow at Breaking Down Bits on social media. Visit the website breakingdownbits.com or shoot us an email at breakingdownbits at gmail.com. <laughs>